So the first question is, do certain meditation methods work better for certain people and how do we know what practices suits us best? <clears throat> now, these type of questions, uh, yes, in, in the, in the um, overall, when we look at it, uh, the first question, uh, when the overall, when we look at it, it is true. There are certain methods that are better for some people or to start for some people. Uh, for example, like if you have a lot of anger, if you have a lot of anger problem, uh, anger issues, uh, then what, what is good to start off is we start off with some metta, uh, some degree of metta. Uh, uh, if you have a very uh, uh, attachment to beautiful things and so on, but you know that development of the mind is important, but you need to reduce that desire first. Uh, sometimes the, the, the practice of uh, 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 32 parts of the body can be also very good. Uh, uh, contemplation or reflection on, on our things, for example, our our things that we wear, or the shelter, or the things, the medicine that we use, you know, the four basic requisites, you know, uh, that type of reflection also is very good for those people who are very attached. Uh, 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 yes, certain, certain method is this. And also, when it, com when it comes into vipassana, you know, when it comes to vipassana, vipassana, huh, you see, it's, suitable for all types of people. It's just that we may have a different method only. Yeah? Different method. But Vipassana is supposed to be a, whatever whatever uh, tendency that you have uh, is suitable to you. Anna. Because later part in the development of the Vipassana, uh, usually the yogis will fall into their own ways of meditation. That means the method, the 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 whole the whole vipassana, you will begin to you know you will tune it to your own how you're going to develop it. Yeah? But it's still in the in the still in the correct way. Uh, now some people, for example, some people like uh, uh, after you meditate for some time, uh, you find that uh, you can you are more keen in the. You're more keen in like Chitta Nupasana, for example. Eh? You're more keen into Chitta Nupasana. But when you are beginning in a meditation, you are, you are doing it a lot of body contemplation, the body, body meditation. But then after some time, you find that your mind is, you'll you find that your, your track of your meditation is goes into Chitta Nupasana. For some people, they are more, more into Dhamma Nupasana. Eh? For some people, it's Vedana, it's the feelings part, and some people, it's the bodily part, you know. So, so after some time when they come into it, the, the, it is split a little bit here and there. Yeah? Although you may be, more pro, may be more better in the, let's say, in the uh, body, but you are still good in the other three, you know. If you're good in the chitta, doesn't mean that you you neglect all the others, you know. But you're still good in all everything. So, so that one depending on after you have developed for some time. But if you are in a beginner, but if you are a beginner, you don't even try to go and choose yet, you know. If you go and try to choose, uh, first of all, you don't have the fundamentals yet. The fundamentals is not strong. You cannot do all these type of things. So the beginning part, you must develop a lot of mindfulness. Uh, you, and the mindfulness is where it comes. You use the body first. And that's why the body in the Kaya Nupasana is the first one. And you use the body first. Then after that, when you have sufficient amount of strong, continuous mindfulness, then, uh, then later part, your mind will automatically know how to adjust it for you. You don't have to go into like, I want this or I want that. It will come in naturally for you. So that time, you know what is suit you best. Okay? All right. Okay. <clears throat> Next question. Is it mm. possible for lay persons to attain stream entry 
If so, what sort of practice regimes are involved? Yeah, uh, for for those who want to attain stream entry, uh, of course there are a number of things that is required from you. Uh, first of all, you must have that faith. Do you have really have that faith that you want to get out of this cycle of birth and rebirth from samsara? Now, a lot of devotees they do not have they do not have this type of faith. They have faith to do good. They have faith to take care of this to to do the sila to do services and so on. But they do not have faith into getting out of this cycle of birth and rebirth. The, to, to, for, for for this one, the stream entry is too far away. And the moment you if you have that state of mind, uh, Celia, it's going to be a long journey for you already. <laughs> a long journey. But if you think that you can do it, then your mind, uh, your whole attitude has changed. So you must have faith. Uh, once you have faith, then also, of course, you must have that energy, you must have that physical health also. If you don't have that physical health, you cannot strive. We need to have that good health and then you need to strive. Yeah? You need to make the effort again and again and again and again and again and again, continuous. Yeah? Therefore, other words, uh, you need to have time also. If you don't have time, then you also cannot. You see, some people like to meditate. Bante, uh, yeah, meditation is good, Bante, but I don't have time, Bante, my work is so much. How to meditate, Bante? Wait until I wait, wait till I, I, I retire first. Uh. But after they retire already, they got choo choo and chichit already, you know. <laughs> they got all kinds of every other thing you want to take care and do. Then how are you going to meditate? Uh, how you, you don't have much time. So, you must look for time. You must spend some time. You must, in your, in your, for example, I, I, when you want to manage time, uh, sometimes I talk about managing time in per year. You know, if you want to be a yogi, you must, if you are working, you must block a certain time for that development of that meditation. You must block. If you don't block that time uh, for it, uh, you that that holiday that you have, you're going to fill it up with kai kai la, uh, with, with tour here and there, with this and that, uh, and then you can go to all kinds of everything. So the meditation will be lasting in your in your mind or not in your list or so. So you got to fully able to block it. Now once you blocked it, you make sure that you go for that retreat, uh, whatever, uh, whatever whatever that you need to do. So make sure that uh, you make that effort when you are striving for a period of time. And here you, you must, if you cannot finish it and then you continue the next retreat, the next retreat, next retreat, next retreat, until you attain it. Uh, so it is, it is possible, not just only stream entry, you want to go all the way to Arahan also can. <laughs> uh, so it is challenging. Huh? It is challenging. Three. Mante, next question. Can, yeah, can okay. lay people practice contemplation of fullness of the body, 32 parts of the body? What are the benefits or disadvantages of such a practice? All right. Okay. Now, this fullness of the body, the 32 parts of the body, huh? um, here, 32 parts of the body is that uh, they are helpful. Uh, they are helpful, but you have to do it First of all, you must have strong, good mindfulness. Uh, if not, these things are going to boomerang and hit you back and hit you hard. Uh, so if you have this mindfulness at hand, uh, then this, this foulness of the body, you start off with head, hair, body, hair, nail, teeth, skin, uh, for example. Uh, head, hair, body, hair, they got 32. Uh, but it, you start off with five first. Uh, uh, then, when you're doing it, you must able to bring about the, the foulness or the disgusting nature of that particular component of the body. I, I'm, what I'm, I'm talking right now, I'm just summarizing the whole thing. Eh? I'm not talking about the whole practice itself. The whole practice is kind of a long thing, but summarizing is that you have to bring your mind 
to see that that particular part of the body is dirty, is disgusting, it is uh, is foul. Uh, uh, for example, you you start off with head hair, body hair, nail teeth. Ah, let's say we start with head hair. How are you going to see the head hair as something which is dirty? Uh, because most of the time we don't see the head hair as dirty. If you're a woman, especially, you love the hair. Uh, for example, when you ask them to go, hey, come be a nana. I cannot, Bante, why cannot? <laughs> because they love the hair. So because the attachment to the hair is so much. So the first thing is that we have to see the hair as something as not beautiful. When you see it's not beautiful, the mind doesn't attach to it. So how do you see it as not beautiful? You see it as head hair. When you see this head hair, you see it as like you reflect that that head hair is like on the ground, on the floor, or or sometimes when you 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 see it in your toilet, na, your whole bunch of your hair is like sticking on the drainage pipe there, you no know, drainage hole there. You got to take it up and then you look at it, uh, whether nice or not, beautiful, na, go sui go, uh. <laughs> then the time uh, not not uh. then but then you reflect on it that when the once the head hair is removed from the body uh, and it's on the ground then it's not something beautiful or you reflect that the head hair that you're able to notice it that if you don't wash it you leave it as it is without you without your intervention then there will be uh, it becomes smelly. There are all kinds of organisms, all kinds of bacteria, fungus or whatever is going to grow into on the hair. And then with that imagination, you your mind is like detached from the attachment of the hair. And you repeat it again and again. Uh, then you be not you become much more uh, you, you become not attached to all this head hair, body hair, nail teeth, skin, and so on. Yeah? But disadvantages, it's not to say there's disadvantages, but, but you must do it correctly. Now, if you don't do it this correctly, especially if you don't have people to guide you, and also you have a weak mindfulness, uh, when you do these things, uh, it can turn into like, your mind become very warped, you know? Like, like when... When you're supposed to see it as just non-attachment, uh, but you are overdoing it until it becomes like, you're terrible, uh, this hair, I must go and, must not go and take care of it anymore. I must don't care about it anymore. Uh, then I must must not have this anymore. Uh, and then if, if, if let's say it nails, uh, you see that your nails is something uh, not beautiful, uh, you begin to want to pull off all the nails. Uh, I think cannot. <laughs> that one is too much. You are doing too much. That is where the teachers comes in to help you to stop you from doing all these things or completely stop you from the meditation also. So, so there must be a certain limit just for you to see this body as something is not beautiful and not overdoing it until you become disgusted with the body even that even when you are uh, uh, in the everyday life, you know, and that one is too much already. Yeah? Uh, that one is too much already because that one is lack of mindfulness instead that is going into aversion already. Yeah. Uh, okay. okay. Thank you, Bhante. Bhante, if yogi finds lying position can concentrate better than sitting position, can they continue? And two, if we meditate in places where there are fresh air like jungle, will it enhance the quality of our meditation? <clears throat> no. Question number question one. If you yoga find cause, eh, this one uh, this one don't try to do it too much. Uh, if you meditate, let's say hundred percent of your meditation time. Uh, let's say this this one uh, may be like five percent, ten percent of your time. Uh, you can if you, if so happen that you do. If you don't do it, also can because sometimes when you 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 find that your concentration is good for a period of time, then you continue for a while. Yeah. But the problem is that with this lying position, uh, your concentration is impermanent. Uh, your mindfulness is impermanent. After a while, say let, later 10 minutes, uh, your, your meditation starts to dip already. But then that time, you don't realize that sometimes your 
sloth and topper at the background is already creeping in slowly and slowly. Uh. And then they, they, one is getting more and one is getting less and then you still doesn't get up yet and then throws your tida already. <laughs> so throws you go sleeping already. So this one is not good. For a short while, yes. Not to say cannot, you know. Not to say cannot. But a short while, yes. But if you, but unless you are a, very well advanced meditator. That is a different thing, you know. But if you are just want to start off, want to don't use this lying position as your know, part of your regime of your meditation. Huh? If we meditate in places where fresher uh, jungle, okay. Now, this one is not necessary. It can be a part of it, yes. But when you are in the jungle, uh, or in the places, uh, there are also other factors you have to keep in mind. Yeah. There are mosquitoes. There are ants. Mm -hmm. There are other, there are snakes that's going to crawl around you. That, that also you have to take into consideration. And if your mind is, is not fearful of all these things, then perhaps it's good. Yeah? Uh, so, but the fresh air in the jungle, sometimes it is... Sometimes the, in the jungle, uh, in, in the forest uh, or in the open, uh, sometimes the air is very stifling. Uh. Like sometimes when you go into a forest, uh, the air is not moving. It's completely still. It's very quiet. And it gets very humid inside there. Can you tahan or not? Uh, can you tahan all the humidity? And sometimes, yes, it's fresh. It's blowing for a while. That's why here, you don't get attached even to the fresh air. You go to the... Do you go to the... Uh, go to the to the place where it's free from people. When you're free from people, like the jungle, like the forest, when you're free from people, it's easier to meditate. But you have to able to sustain your mind. Uh, you must able to have a strong mind, not to get affected by all these animals and insects and so on, and not to get attached with all the quietness and all the all the fresh air and so on. Uh, uh, so. You go in with the, uh, with the, uh, with, and it is good, but don't get attached to all these things. Okay. Next, Pante, how do we di differentiate meditation pain and physical pain? For example, backache, how can, can we overcome the pain during meditation? Simple, uh, this one. If you want to know meditation pain, uh, meditation pain is that when you sit down there, the pain is there. When you get up from the and from the meditation, the pain is disappear. But it's a physical pain, one, uh, you get up, that pain is still hanging there. That means if you have, for example, like a backache, uh, uh, if you have a physical pain in the, in the beginning, uh, then when you finish your meditation, then that physical pain is still there and is there for a, like your whole meditation retreat or your whole time or your whole day or the next day is still there. That means that is physical pain already. That one you need to, perhaps you need to see a doctor already, you know. Uh, meditation pain, you go and see your meditation teacher. <laughs> that one physical pain can be a problem because sometimes that physical pain, uh, if you are not careful, you sit there for a prolonged, going to injure that physical pain for, for, uh, for even more, more, more difficult for you. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. Hmm. Bante, how can med Vipassana meditation guide us to attain a good rebirth at the moment of death, especially when we are sick, bedridden, and in pain? Now, recently, recently, about two or three days ago, I was talking about the heap of wholesomeness. Uh, the Buddha says that what is the heap of wholesomeness? It is then the Buddha mentioned that the heap of wholesomeness is this four foundation of mindfulness. Uh, it, it, the, but the Buddha didn't say dana is a heap of wholesomeness. You know, the Buddha doesn't just say sila is a heap of wholesomeness or whatever your service is. He said the four foundation of mindfulness is heap of wholesomeness. So here, when you say when the the, the mind develops vipassana in all these four foundations of mindfulness, uh, then you, every moment of that purity of the mind, it's wholesome mental action. There's a wholesome mental action. And the more purified your mind is, the stronger that wholesome mental state. Uh, so because of your development of that, that 
powerful marriage that you have and also a mental progress and the wholesome mental states are uh, you are churning it you are arousing it you are sustaining it and then when it comes to death uh, you like you perhaps uh, most probably like uh, or the chances that uh, is much higher if you don't meditate at all you know? the chances are so much more higher. Therefore, and also when we get sick, bedridden of pain, uh, just like just now the talk I was talking about in the beginning part of it, when we deal with pain and so on, uh, this is where also it's become very helpful that your mind become able to tolerate the pain, be patient with the pain. And that when it, you know that the death is coming, you can able to keep your mind open and accept without mind goes into all kinds of sadness and longing or attachment to your wife and to your children, to your this and that. No? And then the mind is so much more at peace and because of the past development of Vipassana, all the marriage has accumulated so much. Then, yes, the chances of good rebirth is higher. I say chances. Uh, huh? <laughs> okay. Seven. One day, I hope to get an answer. I practice Anapasana, Sati and Metta. Get a lot of pity. Body is trembling and shaking. It is both relaxing, comfortable and disturbing. Please advise. Okay, all right. Now here, if if you are doing Anapasana, Sati, uh, if you get a lot of pity, your attention must not stay with the pity. Your attention must come back to the Anapana object. You know, come back to your breathing. Let the pity, you know, let the pleasant sensation of the body right now, you know, or in the mind right now, be at the behind or at the background or surrounding it, surrounding your attention on the main object. Keep to your main object. And yeah, actually, even there's a, some pity going coming up, and that means it shows that there is some development in the anapana. Now, you, you keep on with your object of your anapana and then you keep that that pity around you so that time uh, when your mind is not too paying attention too much to the pity then the relaxation then the all this trembling and shaking become much more less uh. so too when you do the meta also the same thing you keep on to your wordings or you keep on to your radiating of the meta rather than the pity uh. Let's keep on doing the do the meta. Keep on spread the meta, but let the pity be surround you, uh, surround you. And it's perfectly all right. Most people, when they practice this, uh, they tend to attach to the pity rather than than the object of the meditation. That is where all all a lot of sometimes shaking, sometimes the body is moving, sometimes the body is swinging. All these type of things are coming in because of the pity. Uh, now, if this type of pity becomes too much, becomes too much, and then even you are mindful of it, it cannot stop. Uh, uh, so this time you should get up from the sitting for a while. Uh, get up from the sitting for a while, break the sitting, go for a walk, go for a mindful walk, and be a mindful, don't let the mind run here and there, just walk for a while. Uh, just walk for a while. Later, when everything you find that the mind more settled, then come back again. If you cannot control it, if you cannot, if you can control it, put the whole pity aside. Hmm? Okay. Hmm. All right. Okay, next, one. next question: How do we recognize false meditation teachers who are charismatic and able to brainwash us? How do we avoid or get away from such fake, selfish guru? <laughs> Now, this, this question, or similarly to this question, I just answer it on Friday with a, uh, also with a Q&A session, you know, it was a Q&A session, something like this. Yeah? <clears throat> now, in this type of uh, meditation teachers or even teachers or charismatic teachers, uh, then we have to be, I mean, we have to be, in ourselves, uh, we must have certain fundamentals first. Uh, and the fundamentals comes in with the, um, you know, you must have some basic understanding of the suttas or the 
or the Abhidhamma or the Vinaya or the Tipitaka, you know. And also there are commentaries, you know, what commentary. And, then, and nowadays they have a lot of like, uh, you know, translation and the commentary from and uh, uh, and behind, you know. And then that is where that is where the Theravada understanding falls, you know. Now, you must have that as, as much as you can. And that that will be very good. The problem is nowadays, uh, there are people who don't want the commentaries. You know? They only want the suttas because, because they thought that these commentaries uh, are not the words of the Buddha. But the problem with the present teachers are some present teachers, not so all. Uh, some present teachers, they can do the commenting themselves, but they disregard the commentaries that has been laid down as being vetted and also being scrutinized by the whole Buddhist council. Yeah? All the, 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 the monks and the learned and the learned practitioners and all vetted it and so on. Yeah? They disregard it, some teachers, and then they use their own interpretation to, to interpret these things. So when they do these things, uh, they, they interpret the suttas in all kinds of ways. And here, there are times also I, I hear from, from the suttas talk about non-self, non-self. Uh, then to some teachers says, cannot be non-self, man ma. This must be self into it. How can there be non-self? Then they are going against all the teachers already, all the, 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 even the fundamentals of the suttas also already. Uh, then they come with all kinds of, all kinds of uh, uh, explanation and so on. And their explanation can be very good, very interesting. Uh, then we get caught into it, uh, see all uh, like that. Because this time we are not using our wisdom, we are not discerning already. We are just blind faith and then just completely open and surrendering to because they are, they are good in speaking. Nowadays, you those people who are wearing robes or wearing, whether it's me or whether it's this and all that thing, the next thing that you have to do is to put it into practice. Because only when you put into practice what you have learned in, whether in the daily life or in the meditation, after some time when you develop the mind, then only you realize that you, your discerning factor become much more clearer, which one is wholesome, which one is wrong. That time you can able to scrutinize even myself or other monks or other teachers, then you can scrutinize, hey, Bante talk this one, I think it is not so correct. Oh, that Bante talk, I think that one is proper. This one is not proper. Something like that, you know. Your mind can able to distinguish it better. Because first, you must have the fundamental theory that you must have. Two, you must have a lot of practice. So if you don't have this, both of that, these two criteria, it's very difficult for you to know which one is the real and which one is not. If it's just like, I give you a, a diamond, you know. When I, I give you a diamond. If you are, you have not, know anything about the diamond, everything you see sui only, uh, very shining only, must be real already. Uh. <laughs> All right. So you, you must have that, like a, a, a jeweler, they can able to look into it, they can able to see it, they scrutinize it, they discern it, uh, then they come into a conclusion, this is a real diamond, this is a fake diamond. So too, the same thing like we also as a, as a this one, they are right, Dhamma and also there's also a lot of Adhamma or wrong Dhamma. Yeah? Even nowadays, a, a lot of these devotees also, they are not only this one, not only they are not nowadays they are quoting from even from other religion and they put into into the Buddhist this one also because sometimes they thought that oh this is morality, fine. But the whole thing, the morality that they are these teachers are talking is is connected to God, connected to, to some universal consciousness, to connected to something which is permanent. Where therefore, this morality uh, is not the right morality, you know. This is not the right sila. Although it sounds nice, although it sounds correct, but, it's con but they are connecting it to, to a lot of wrong view. So a lot of times I see when people are just posting in their, their share, 
whatever things from other religion. Uh, I see it. I know it's something wrong already. But there are devotees just say, wow, everything's so beautiful, so nice, so sweet, uh, everything. <laughs> just like you see a fake diamond, I think that is all real. Huh? Okay. Uh, what's your, but okay. next. Next question. One day, I was told that focusing on rising and falling of the dormant is a vipassana meditation, while focusing on the breath is considered samatha meditation. Can Bhante please clarify? <clears throat> um, you see, this vipassana, uh, rising, falling of the abdomen, or in breath, out breath, uh, they are all fundamentally, they are all just wind element. Yeah, just wind element. Right? And wind element, whether you are doing whether you are doing rising falling or breath uh, they can both of them can go both ways can go both ways either go into vipassana or going into samatha it all depends on how you divert the mind you know just like how you want to divert the water you go into a certain path so to so to the mind, so to the mind, if you have people to guide you, a, a competent teacher to guide you, then they, if you want to practice vipassana, then they will push your mind towards that particular way to notice it in particular way. Therefore, it goes into a vipassana, and you notice it in a certain another way, looking it in another way, then it goes into samatha, whether it is a whether it's a whether it's a rising falling or whether it's a in breath out breath okay the principle is like this but in the in the real world in the real world in the real world is that when we do rising and falling uh, most of the time most of the time it's related to vipassana most of the time it's related to vipassana and most of the time when you do in breath out breath it's related to samatha meditation this is in the real world but in principle both of it can be developed now here if you are a very skillful yogi uh, uh, in in the beginning if you if you have that sort of idea that rising falling you know you stay with vipassana in breath out, in breath out say with samatha it's still okay not to say that you are wrong you know because of our our limitation of our mental development right now in the beginning partner it is easier for you to separate like that if not now i will tell you hey this one also can do like that also can do uh. then you go inside the meditation you completely mong cha cha you know <laughs> you do not know what is what uh. Uh, so in principle yes but in practice as i said you need to have a uh, uh, a teacher to guide you and it depends on the, how you want to develop it then you seek for the certain teacher and then they will they guide you in that certain way okay Ken? thank you Bhante. last question, you, okay. question. yeah last question mm. after attaining calmness and tranquility during meditation can a person let go of his career or join monkhood <laughs> Oh, I want to join monkhood now. Oh, okay, okay, okay. First of all, you must not attach to your to your hair, huh? Or nunhood also. <laughs> now, attaining calm and tranquility is not the only criteria that you want to join monkhood, because this tran calmness and tranquility they are not permanent. They are not permanent. They are fluctuating here and there. After that, you join the monkhood already, then no calmness, no tranquility. You want to get out again or not? <laughs> you join it because you have an ul the motive is an ulterior motive and it's not right. And that that calmness and tranquility should not be your it should not be your criteria to join monkhood or nunhood. You all want to join monkhood or nunhood. Uh, your criteria is to get out of this cycle of birth and rebirth and because of the monkhood you have the conditions for you to practice better therefore because the monkhood or nunhood you don't have to work you don't have to go in you don't go in outside to buy things and outside to work and all that then you have a lot of time on your side 
and a lot of time you use it for the development of the mind and the development of the mind don't go and attach to the calmness and the tranquility because they are impermanent and they are not part they are part of the meditation but a lot of time people get attached to this tranquility your job is the final goal on all of us hopefully in the future we have a clarity of mind to see a final goal that we can able to get out of this cycle of birth and rebirth not just this calmness and tranquility okay hmm. okay